Thank you. Buju, which is hello in Ojibwa. Before I start, I want to land acknowledge that we are on the traditional homelands of the Ho-Chunk Nation. And I want to uh, thank and be humbled that we're here and able to present. I'm able to share this story with you. And I want to thank you all for your kind uh, hospitality and welcome to Professor Shaw and Ms. Brichette and to uh, Claire and Kate all for helping me be here today. So we're going to have some fun. I'm going to share with you um, a tool. I know that you guys are all interested in science communication, so there's many different tools for science communication. And I'm going to share with you one tool that I've used successfully for climate uh, science communication, and that is the Gikinu Wizziwe Anji Waban climate literacy model. It's a, an Ojibwe word which means guiding for tomorrow, given to us by a tribal elder. So first of all, a disclaimer. This is a polar bear free program. Not that polar bears aren't being affected by climate change, but you'll see through the revelation of the GWA model why we don't focus on things like polar bears. We are using a climate literacy model or an interpretive model that relates to people and what they value and where they live and work. So climate change is certainly affecting polar bears, but one of our messaging problems with climate change messaging is polar bears are out of sight, out of mind, aren't they? Long ways away. And oftentimes our messaging, too, I can throw this in, is way in the distant future, 2100, there might be climate impacts. We want to look a little closer to home when we're interpreting climate change to our audiences. So I'm going to demonstrate this interpretive framework for you. And it's a climate change framework, but you can use this in your science communication. Again, it's one tool. It's a very practical tool. I want to acknowledge some of our project partners, kind of set the stage. I work for the Division of Extension. We've now changed our logo to the UW logo, and I forgot to change it on the slide. Uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, representing the 11 Ojibwa tribes and off-reservation uh, treaty rights on the ceded territory of northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. The National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service, and the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center in Ashland. And like with any big project like this, there's a whole boatload of partners that have helped us along the way. The location is within the ceded territories of the two northern states here, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. We're pretty much based on the Ashland or Shawamigan Bay area on the Bad River and Red Cliff Tribal Reservations and the Shawamigan Bay communities. But the model I'm going to share with you is applicable to all cultures and locations. And in fact, the elder that gave us the name Jiwa, Kinkanu Wizziwe Anjiwaban, I'll refer to it as Jiwa because it's much quicker and easier to say, reminded me this is not for Native people only. This is for all cultures. So we're in the heart of Indian country. Our project roots, how did we get started on this whole thing? Well, there was increasing evidence that climate, a changing climate was beginning to affect our Lake Superior communities and public safety on those federal lands that the partners represent, the Park Service and the Forest Service. So we've had extreme flooding event. I didn't put up a slide here of 2012 when the Duluth Zoo flooded out, but 2014, 15, 16, 18. A lot of extreme storm events happening. And I'm sure we've all noticed extreme storm events around the country and world, haven't we, this year? Yep. And so the, the federal partners, the Park Service and Forest Service, were very concerned about public safety. The Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, and I will probably refer to them as GLIFWIC, so that's what that acronym means, they were really concerned about how climate change was affecting the Ojibwe people's right to exercise their treaty rights, to hunt, fish, and gather, because climate change was beginning to affect the species and habitats that supported those treaty rights. And as an educator and communicator, science communicator, I was realizing that our traditional climate literacy models based on tech transfer were just simply not working. People would see these charts and their eyes would glaze over and you'd lose them. So there had to be a better way. So we came together as a team with a goal of trying to create a model that would actually increase people's awareness of climate change, but to do something about it, to take action. That's the bottom line of all this. We want people not only to increase awareness, we want them to act. And the result was GWO. And we're going to talk about how we model this and how it uses interpretation. So being a good extension person, I did a little research. And we found some very helpful research that kind of uh, established part of the pinnacles of GWO. And that's it's very common sense. Local place-based evidence of climate change is going to be as effective or even more effective than simply using analytical climate data. Doesn't that make sense? If you can see it and feel it, it's close by. Again, go back to the polar bears. If it's something that it's affecting you within your own sphere of influence, within your own community, it's going to resonate a lot more with you. And I love this cartoon. I'll let you read that for a second. I think that kind of sums it all up. Um, all right. So 
So that's one of the foundations of GWAL. But the other thing is that it's built on an interpretive framework. So what, does, what is an interpretive communication framework? So interpretation is really an effective form of communication that reveals um, deeper meanings and connections and makes objects or topics, we say, come alive to people because it will resonate with them. It can be used in many different formats. It can be used in signage, like park signage. It can be used, off the park service uses this a lot. It can be used by a park ranger, a teacher, um, and you can use it in your science communication, and I'll show you how. It's based on the work of Freeman Tilden. In the 50s, he kind of put all this stuff together and the research on it and wrote a book called Interpreting Our Heritage, which is really directed at park service rangers, but it has all of the elements of interpretation in it that I'm going to share with you. So again, instead of translations of facts, or what we might call tech transfer, in speaking about a science topic, in this case I'm speaking of climate change, we want to reveal deeper meanings, kind of aha moments to people, connections, relationships, uh, and getting them to move towards action. So this is what Freeman Tilden wrote about interpretation and interpreting our heritage through interpretation, understanding, through understanding, appreciation, through appreciation, protection. Remember he's writing that for the Park Service, for people that are interpreting mountains and national monuments. What we like to say in GWAL is this, through climate interpretation, understanding, through understanding, awareness, through awareness, climate action. So see, we've kind of morphed it around a little bit. Oh. Interpretive communication will include all of these principles, and so can your science communication. Here's the first one, okay? What you're speaking about must relate to a person's experience or values, or otherwise it's sterile. And again, I'm hopping back to our first example of the Polar Bear Free Program, okay? So we want to talk to people in, in the context of, of activities, cultural practices, economic practices they value. Here's a man and his daughter tapping a maple tree. We can talk to them and reveal to them how climate change is affecting this, this practice that they value, maybe even use for, for generating some money for their family. Will it resonate more with them than polar bears? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so it's not tech transfer, as I mentioned before. It's a revelation of information. Again, building those deeper connections. What is happening? Place-based examples of what's happening to something that they value. It tells the whole. So interpretive communication tells a whole. It tells the whole story, not just bits and parts, but the whole story. So the whole connection to the person is revealed. And it's very activist in its nature. It only it increases awareness, but its real intention is to provoke, to provoke action on whatever subject that you're talking about. Calling for action. I like to call it the big so what. So what's the big so what of our communication? What do we really want to do? Just get people to understand something, or do we want them to do something? And finally, it's an art. I didn't know how you could project art, so I thought this cool little hand with the different color, you know, finger painting things. It's an art. You can make the, this work in whatever way you want, in the format, sign, brochure, website, you can use these principles, speaking, you can use these principles. You can also use it as an art in terms of how you fashion it, and I'm going to show you how we've done that through some creative ways that we've, that we've worked our GWA model. Some of them are kind of fun, and you're going to help me with a few of them. Okay, so relate, reveal, tell the whole, and provoke. That's a really important one. And it's an art, which means it's teachable and you all can, can use it in whatever way you find creatively accessible to you. So how does this work for our GWAL climate model? Okay, I'm gonna demonstrate this through many examples. So if this doesn't seem perfectly clear right now, it will. By revealing how climate change is affecting the sustainability of species and habitats that support cultural practices people value, okay, resonates with them by integrating, telling the whole, place-based evidence they can observe with climate science to provoke action. See the elements of interpretation in there? I kind of underline them too. So, the cultural practice of fly fishing depends on the sustainability of what? Fish. Which fish? Brook trout? Brook trout, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we can talk to people about the sustain, what they're observing in terms of fly fishing, their creole amounts, uh, water temperatures, what they're observing, more fish, less fish. We can take a look at what the species needs to thrive and survive, and in the case of brook trout, cold, clear water. And then we can find out whether or not our water temperatures are increasing based on place-based evidence, and link that up with what climate projections say will be happening to our temperatures in the summer. Will our water temperatures, are they projected to increase with climate change, or do you think decrease? 
increase, right? What does that mean for the sustainability of brook trout across Wisconsin? We're less sustainable. Right, less sustainable. What does that mean to a cultural practice like fly fishing? Or if you have a business that you're selling fly fishing things? It becomes more precarious. Right, okay, would that make climate change come alive to you if you like to do this? That's the point of this. We're increasing, right now we're doing this, we're doing the setup for the spike. We're increasing awareness, the spike is gonna be the action piece that we call for later. So I'm gonna run through some examples of the increasing awareness piece. Okay, so there's one more thing that GWAL does that's kind of different than other interpretive models. We um, use climate impacts on the cultural practices of the Lake Superior Ojibwa to provide an indicator to evaluate place-based evidence. Why do we do this? Well, not only are we in the heart of Indian country, it's the right thing to do, but indigenous people have long relied, they have long-term relationships with the land and the animals, the species, and they have relied on the sustainability of them for generations to support cultural practices or life ways. So we see here a historic picture of some Ojibwe gentlemen wild ricing, harvesting the Newman, which is the word for wild rice, it means good berry. And here we see in modern times, people harvesting much in the same way. So we have a long-term knowledge, place-based knowledge of how the species and habitats may be changing here, which can help those of us who are not from indigenous cultures who may be observing changes that might truly be weather variability. And there's some good research behind this I'll share with you. So you can read there, we call it traditional ecological knowledge. Some people call it uh, indigenous ecological knowledge. But it's a way of evaluating, again, these place-based changes that provides a baseline for us. Because there are some issues with looking at place-based change. And this comes out of some research out of Canada, and it's kind of common sense as well. Um, these researchers, Sarkar and Stoddard, found that this, uh, in Steve, I think it was Stevensville, um, Nova Scotia, I think it was, or yeah, no, was it Newfoundland? Um, they found a community that was sure that they had climate change impacts and they went back and actually researched it and it was weather variability. The community had not been on the land long enough to really evaluate whether it was weather variability, you know, it's cold today, it's warm today, we have polar vortexes so therefore there's no climate change, or is it truly climate change? But if we can put on top of our evaluation of place-based evidence, indigenous knowledge, TEK, long-term knowledge, we have a much better way to measure it, don't we, to compare? What if you don't have indigenous people that you're working with? Perhaps you can ask an elder in the community or someone that has been in the community for a long time or hearken back to the resources that we have in our GWA model to provide that perspective. All right, so our TEK observations tend to be qualitative, made by, usually made uh, observation in a single sort, single area over a long period of time. So again, we get away from that weather variability issue when we're trying to evaluate climate change and it's by the users of the resources themselves versus our quantitative scientific observations which tend to be by small groups, many places, or maybe a couple points in time, and they frequently lack that long-term perspective. I'm gonna throw a couple resources out for you too so that you can go and learn more about this if you want to kind of drill down. Some of you might be familiar with Robin Kimmerer, uh, who is a Potawatomi uh, PhD botanist at SUNY College in New York State. Uh, she integrates traditional ecological knowledge and Western botany science and has a wonderful book called Braiding Sweetgrass, which I would highly, some of you read her, it's a really great book. I took some of these quotes from her uh, article. She's a great source if you'd like to kind of drill down and understand more about weaving these two ways of knowing together. All right, so what are some sources of traditional ecological knowledge that we can use? Um, great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission just did us a great favor. They have just come out with a climate vulnerability assessment based on talking to language, knowledge, language keepers, knowledge keepers, and elders in, in the Ojibwe tribes across the three states. And they have come up with their first list of vulnerability of different species. The most vulnerable being Wabus, the snowshoe hare, and we'll talk about the reason why. And the least, the strawberry. There's only, and they call these species beings in respect for their status with the creator as beings, not just species. And they'll be coming up with more, they're, I think eventually going to have 80 some species within their vulnerability assessment. So we, the GWA model integrates that qualitative place-based evidence with quantitative, what we might call Western science. I can't come up with a better term for that, but we use science in a mapping format so it's easy for learners and users to see rather than those charts and graphs I talked about. We use it from vetted sources. NASA and NOAA, the Wisconsin Institute on Climate Impacts, which is here at the Nelson Institute. And we use very middle-of-the-road projections for climate change. 
evaluations, kind of like we don't get our act together and decrease carbon emissions and we don't increase them, we're just kind of doing the same thing that we're doing right now. All right, so let's just take a look at how Wisconsin's climate is changing, and I don't want to make you climate scientists, that's not my intention, but it'll set the stage for what we're going to talk about. Unprecedented cancellations of the wild rice harvest for the Lake Superior Ojibwe tribes, okay? Never before in their history have they had so many disruptions from the mid-2000s to last year from flooding, disease, drought, etc. Ice cover changes on Lake Superior. The extreme weather events we talked about are some examples of place-based evidence. We can look at phenological evidence. Everybody know what phenological means? Yeah, okay. So here we have Aldo Leopold and his daughter Nina Leopold. 60 years of phenological observations through journaling. Look at the changes that they have documented. And you can see the changes in the seasons, but the greatest change has been in northwestern Wisconsin in the heart of Ojibwe Indian country, okay? Warming temperatures, changes in phenology. We have the USDA, not really the most climate uh, activist group in the world, and you can see the changes in the hardiness zones. Northern Wisconsin, formerly in zone, gosh, three, now we're in zone four, almost pushing five. What does that mean for agriculture, gardening? We might be able to grow something in warmer weather crops, maybe some of our tree species will not be able to survive in those warmer conditions. Let's take a look at some of our quantitative infrared evidence. Uh, we have measurements from the state of Wisconsin showing temperature increases. And you might notice that this is a little bit dated, right? 2000, 1950 to 2006. This is what we call historical data. It's not a projection. It's in the books. It's been measured, you know. Increases, two to two and a half degree increase in Fahrenheit in, north, in northwestern Wisconsin. This information has not been updated by the state climatology website and I've been looking around for updated information and I can't find it so just put that in your hat so anyways but this is this is what I have for historical data right now let's take a look at projections okay what might we expect again these are from vetted sources this is middle of the road a1b scenario we're conservative on our climate projections we're looking at overall warming and you can see from our state map a lot of it will be in northwestern Wisconsin Warmer winters, and I hope you can see the colors on this map. Um, the warmer winters up here, warming by almost 20 some degrees in the winter time, and more extreme weather. Let me go back to that one. So more precipitation increases, but more extreme weather, particularly in northwestern Wisconsin. These big gusher rain events. And what did we see with our flooding that we talked about? And I showed you the pictures of. We're seeing place-based evidence of that. All right. Some of you say, well, what about the polar vortex? Is that weather variability or climate change? What do you think? The frequency of vortexes maybe? Yeah, the frequency of vortexes. So I've been giving presentations like this for years, and I started to kind of document the polar vortex eye or whatever they're called. So the first one, 2014, man, this was a bad one. It was like near record cold. We had, we had uh, carbon levels at 398, which were the highest ever. It was, but it was the hottest year globally, even though it was cold in the Midwest. Then we had another one in 2015. Okay, and I, I mentioned that Alaska was the warmest since records began. Yeah, that was broken in 2015. It was the hottest year globally on record. And we had the highest levels of carbon dioxide in, as greenhouse gas, even though we in the Midwest had record cold and snow. 2016, we had another one. I'm going to run out of room on this slide. Again, record cold, Alaska warmest on record, hottest year globally was 2016, and we had the highest levels of CO2 emissions. This year, our polar vortex eye, or vortex, we had record cold and snow. It was a tough winter. It was the second warmest in Alaska, the fourth warmest year globally, and this is where we're at right now on our, carb our carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 411 parts per million. So we keep increasing. So keep that in mind. The research is out right now. The scientists are working on whether the vortex are caused by instability in the jet stream that's causing kind of a wobbly jet stream that's basically like allowing the refrigerator door or the freezer door to open to allow that rush of cold air into the upper part of the continental US. So over the last four years, to five year periods have been the warmest stretches in the contiguous US on record. So we've got to keep that in mind when we're looking at extreme events like this. So we're going to have some climate winners and losers. Okay? That will depend on variables such as temperature, precipitation, and drought. And these will affect the plants and animals that support our cultural practices and habitats that support our cultural practices. And we depend on these for fun, for recreation, for economics. So 
we're going to we're going to talk about actually the framework of the GWA model. I'm going to introduce it kind of in a vertical format, and then we're going to look at several examples in more of a schematic format. Okay. So let's take a look at wild rice harvesting. Wild rice is obviously important to the Lake Superior Ojibwa for cultural practices, for subsistence. It's considered a sacred food. Okay. It's harvested as it was for generations. It depends on the sustainability of the good berry, wild rice. What does wild rice need to thrive and survive? Does anybody know about wild rice? What does it need? Water. Yeah, water. yeah. So it's a grass, it's an aquatic grass. It needs shallow water growing conditions, moderate water level fluctuations, otherwise it can drown like any plant or be washed away, and cool growing season conditions, okay? So we've talked a little bit about this. We've talked about the unprecedented place-based evidence in traditional ecological knowledge of wild rice harvesting being disrupted. Okay, that has never been experienced before. Some people also say in the language, Manubinikegesis, the moon of wild rice harvesting, does not sync up when wild rice is harvested. Other elders tell me that Manubinikegesis occurs whenever we harvest wild rice. So it's a movable thing. But many say that the language, even in the language, which is very, very old, it doesn't sync up anymore when, when things are being harvested. Our quantit quantitative evidence, we are going to see more heat, we're going to see more drought, and projected to see more of those gusher rain events. What does that mean for the sustainability of Manuman? Yeah, less sustainable. Yeah, less sustainable. What does this mean to this cultural practice of the Lake Superior Ojibwe? A serious problem, right? Let's take a look again. We're, now I'm going to take that model and putting it into the schematic. Okay, so from now on we're going to be looking at the GWA model and practicing it in this um, horizontal format. Cultural practice, key species, an example of place-based evidence, and we have the projected gusher rain events. So we've talked about, you can kind of wonder what this means for the sustainability. If you were an Ojibwe person, would this make climate change come alive to you? Be concerned? Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a great concern to the Ojibwe tribes. Let's take another one. Here's a cultural practice that you might be doing right now. Maple yeah. syrup. Yeah, maple syrup. Relies on Sugar maple trees that require cool spring nights for sap production and quality. So this year, how is it going with maple syruping? And anybody tapping? I hear it's pretty good, but time will tell. The last couple of years, it's been very up and down because we have not had those cool nights. We've had really, really warm nights. And if we take a look at projected changes in Wisconsin spring temperatures, again, it's going to be hard for you to see this because the colors aren't coming very well. We're going to have about a six degree increase in spring temperatures, which is going to affect the maple syrup runs. Those temperatures are coming on faster and they're affecting maple syrup production. So that could affect you if you like eating pancakes with maple syrup or maybe you're a maple syrup producer and that's money for your family. Okay? Here's another one. We talked about this one. This is our brook trout example. The bottom line here, again, we're looking at summer temperatures. We have place-based evidence of drying streams, of warming streams, of fewer fish in people's creels that they're catching. Okay? And we can take a look and say, does culture and science agree? Are these things syncing up? Do they agree with each other? We can take a look at projections that are happening. And these are projections from, from 1980 to 2055. I should have mentioned that earlier, sorry. So they're within our lifetime right now and probably our children's lifetimes, if not within there. So we're seeing projected changes in Wisconsin's summer temperatures of almost five to six degrees increase. Project climate models project we're gonna lose about 95% of our brook trout streams in Wisconsin. Would that make climate change come alive to you? If you were, yeah, something's happening here. Here's a fun one that I wanna share with you because this is a direct application of the TEK from, um, from Glyphwick. This is Waboos, the snowshoe hare. Oops, come back Waboos. Okay, so we're not going to worry about consumption hunting or whatever. So just Waboos. Waboos needs snowy habitats for winter camouflage, snowy winter habitats. So what we're finding is because of warming that's happening, we're finding Waboos like this in the woods because there's not enough snow to hide him. So he's turning white because it's winter time. You know, his system says it's winter time, I'm turning white, but no snow. Do you think he's really open to predation? <laughs> yeah, he's like a sitting duck, right? Okay, so if we take a look at Wisconsin temperatures, we will be warming, we'll be warming up to almost, well, come back here. We'll be warming up almost maybe to eight to nine degrees in northern Wisconsin. That means snow will be falling as rain. Will not, <coughs> there will not be snowy conditions to hide Wabus. This is why Wabus 
and the vulnerability of species based on knowledge of elders and language and, and um, traditional ecological knowledge are saying Wabus. They've seen the changes in Wabus. It is the most vulnerable species. So again, we're using this. We're using this as an example of applying the GWA model. So not all species and activities are going to be climate losers. Anybody deer hunting? Deer hunt? Or maybe you like to see deer? Okay. White-tailed deer, species, highly adaptable to a lot of different uh, habitat types. They need some winter shelter, right, to get out of the cold. We see deer populations increasing in the state. If we take a look at that TEK vulnerability assessment of Glyphworth Wawakeshi, is not very vulnerable because it is so adaptable. And that's what tribal elders are seeing and are telling us based on their long-term knowledge. And again, if we take a look at that map of the frequency of cold nights in Wisconsin, the darker the color, the fewer cold nights below zero. So northern Wisconsin, up to 24 fewer cold nights below zero. Will that help the white-tailed deer survival? Sure. So this is a species that's projected to actually be a winner with climate change. Limiting factors, possibly ticks, tick-borne diseases, CWD, which is not really related to climate change, but there could be limiting factors when population numbers increase. All right, now we're gonna have some fun. This is the creative part, okay? Remember the hand with the different colors? So this is an example from South Milwaukee, okay? I asked some teachers and students, what is your favorite cultural activity? And they said, perch fish fries on Friday night. Go figure. So what's the key species you need for perch fish fries? Perch, yeah, okay. So perch, they're not a cold water species, they're a cool water species. Warmer water uh, favors invasives that compete with them. What's an example, if you were thinking, okay, what could be a place-based example of something happening with perch and perch fish fries that would make you say, hmm, maybe something's going on here with the sustainability of this species? You gotta think creatively. Some new invasive species. Maybe some more invasive species, yeah. This is kind of a tricky one. I'll give it to you. Perch fish fries are going up in cost because there's fewer perch being caught by local fishers. Okay, perch fish fries are going up. This was the place-based evidence that they found. And if we take a look at temperature increases in Lake Michigan, now remember we're in Milwaukee, Lake Michigan temperatures are increasing. So the sustainability of yellow perch is being affected by climate change, which our students are feeling in their Friday night fish fries. Creative example, a little wonky, but here's another example to show you that this could be applied in a non-indigenous community in a different culture totally. This comes from a conversation I had on, on a NOAA conference call from Southern California from a naturalist who liked taking her student out in the Everglades. And I said, cool, what's the problem? She goes, well, we can't do it anymore. We have, I said, why? Invasive Bernese pythons on our trails. Mm -hmm. So she said, can you help me work through the model? And you can see how we can, the supplies, right? Okay, what do they need to thrive and survive? They like tropical environments. Now we're talking about Florida here, right? I said, what's the place-based evidence that you're seeing? She said, a lot more snakes on the trails. So in order to depict this for, for you guys here, I found a great uh, 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 diagram here that showed circles, 50 or more pythons found. So there's more pythons being found, which is obviously affecting this practice. And I'm not a Florida science, climate scientist, but if it's getting warmer and moister in, in Wisconsin, what do you think it's doing in Florida? So I said, how do you think that's going to affect the species? And she said, oh my gosh, we're going to get more pythons. Mm -hmm. Great, yes. Would that make climate change come alive to you? Yeah, you may not want to go walking in the Everglades anymore either. But how would this affect maybe not only her, her practice, but ecotourism in the Everglades? Okay. Here's another one. This is a non-species habitat dependent cultural practice. Culture practice, snowboarding. Anybody snowboard or ski? Okay. What have you been noticing over the past couple of years? In habitat, what would be the habitat that you need, first of all? Snow. Yeah, snow, right. What have you been noticing? Anything? Snow. Yeah, it's been kind of iffy. I used to work in the ski business. I was assistant manager of Blackjack Ski Area in big snow country in Bessemer, Michigan. Maybe some of you have skied there. We put in snow making in the 1980s because we could rely on our snow off Lake Superior and we usually get a whole load of it too. So we put in snow making uh, as a marketing tool and now it's almost a necessity to have that because we can't rely on snow throughout the year that's reliable. The Burke of Island has the same problem, but that's even more exacerbated because it's a trail rather than a hill. It's really difficult to put snow making on a trail. But again, we're looking at that winter temperature 
uh, diagram of projected change, and it syncs up. We are getting less snow, more rain in the wintertime, which is affecting this cultural practice and also economic practices. We might even change this into snowmobiling. And many of our counties, especially further south, are having problems with snowmobile trails. An economic driver in the wintertime, trails can't be open because there's not enough snow. This is an economic practice, very much a similar type of scenario, winter logging. I use this example a lot when I'm speaking to more conservative audiences up north, especially loggers, but they get it, okay? They need frozen roads in order to get their logs out in the wintertime. What they're finding is they're finding more of the swamps and wet areas are soft and they're dropping in their skitters and they're not able to get their logs out. Again, we're using one of the winter temperature maps that show increase in winter temperatures and lack of cold nights to freeze the roads. So less frozen ground, less harvesting of logs, less money to the family, less money to the business. And we even have uh, place-based quotes from a logger here. He must have been an older logger because he's been logging since 1949. 38 days of frozen ground lost. So that's money in the pocket. Would that make climate change come alive to you? So you can see how this is working. And this is the framework of the entire interpretive framework. So again, relate, reveal, tell the whole, and then we're going to ask for action. Okay? All right. So to sum it up, the GWO model, this particular model links place-based and scientific evidence. I think you've got enough examples of how that works. It's culturally relevant. It's movable. You can take it to different places and cultures. And it resonates with people because it's something that they value. So, quiz. What is the purpose of interpretation? The ultimate purpose. Action. Yeah, yay, gold star for you. Action, right, provocation, the big so what. Okay, always remember that in your communication, no matter what you're saying. The what is the big so what of your, you're trying to accomplish. Okay, awareness to action. So, we've been talking about awareness, kind of setting the ball up, and the spike is the action piece. And we could go into many different actions, but I'm gonna share just a a couple ideas with you. We have many more ideas on our website and with our curriculum that we offer. So this is a sticky issue, isn't it, climate change? Communication is one thing that we can do. We all have this, ears, first of all, I'm going to start with ears, and a mouth, that we can communicate about climate change. In fact, communication is so important. I picked this up this morning. The feature article is about communication in your on Wisconsin magazine, pick it up. It's really interesting. It talks a little bit about climate change, but the importance of communicating with others, especially those that have different, maybe, perspectives as you might. Okay, so communication is really important. That's why the work that you're doing is so critical. You can use the GWA model as one tool for communication, okay? Speaking to values that resonate with people. Listening to what they say, first of all, it's always easy to try to get our point in across, right? But listen first to their story, and then find a way to relate that. Relate climate change information using the GWAL model to them, okay? Stress opportunities for, that climate change presents, and there are opportunities, economic opportunities, changes that we can take advantage of, adaptation strategies that we can use, and then learn more about effective science communication, which obviously you're involved in because you're here today. So science communication is important. There's a lot of misinformation out there about climate change, and I probably don't need to tell you that. I love this. Global warming is baloney. Drive through open 24 hours, okay? We have the Heartland Institute. We have think tanks that are actively producing curriculum, including curriculum that they're delivering directly to our middle and high school teachers, which stresses doubt. You know, scientists don't agree on this. There's doubt about this. There's no evidence, okay? So we have think tanks that are actively communicating misinformation. And we also have things like this. The sun is the main driver of climate change, not you and not CO2. Friends of science. They must be right, right? They're the friends of science, for Pete's sakes. So we have communication like this that we need to help people understand what is really happening. Things are shifting, though. So one of the, one of the great resources on climate communication, again, a resource that you might want to drill down into, is Yale Communication. Yale University Communi Climate Communication website. They have a very robust website with a lot of different research. Uh, they have a seminal research called the Six Americas, six different Americas that have different attitudes about climate change. The research started back in the earlier 2000s, and the latest research shows a shift. People are shifting from being dismissive or doubtful or disengaged. I don't care about it. It's in the polar bears and it's not going to affect me. They're shifting more towards really 
oh, that's not just our worst. They're really shifting their awareness to becoming more alarmed and more concerned about it, to do something about it. So this is brand new research. But you can go on this website and you can, you can segment out uh, Republicans' values about uh, uh, climate change, and there's research done by Yale on that, Latino, um, different uh, economic sectors, different strategies for communication. What also Yale Communication Research has found, and this is kind of an odd diagram to look at, but this is 2013, when the, it was 2013 when they did the Six Americas, forgive me. And this is 2018. If you take a look at the shifts in terms of 14% of the U.S. population that they surveyed, and it's a very large sample size, was alarmed about climate change, that has increased to 29%. So we're having a shift to each of these groups, concerned, cautious, being more, be more concerned, and the dismissive, disengaged, and doubtful be fewer. So the communication is working. But remember, we also have this communication happening on the other side. That's why peer-reviewed um, strategic communication is very important. This is an excellent website, too. This is also Yale Communication. This is an interactive tool that you might want to play with. You can take a look at, you can drill down and find out estimated uh, percentage of adults who think something is happening. In this case, I queried on global warming is happening, okay? You can query about how many talk to their friends about climate change. There's a whole set of query questions that you can ask. And I said, well, let's do Dane County, okay? Because we're here at Dane County, right? So in Dane County, wow, 49% of the population here, the registered voters that they sample, feel that climate change is happening. 67% in Wisconsin, much lower. The county where I live, Iron County, is 67%. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of work to do up there, don't I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But look at this. Only 33 discuss occasionally with others. They don't communicate about it. They may think it's happening and agree with it that it's happening. I'm concerned. But they don't communicate because they don't understand how to do it effectively. All right. So is GMO effective communicating about climate change? We have some limited research on the model itself provided by teachers who have participated in our education institutes, and it does show that it is effective, it increases confidence, and it's transferable. How are we doing on time? Are we getting close? Uh, you have about 50 minutes. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. So here's another resource that you can use. This is our online climate, GWA climate uh, curriculum. It's targeted to middle school and above learners, so it's got some middle school type activities in it, but you can look through it and see TEK-based based examples on four Ojibwe lifeways. So let's say you wanted to do a program on climate change. You could use one of the lifeways as an example and plug in that TEK of how things are changing, okay? Integrated with science, if we want to call it Western science, so science from research from federal, state, and tribal sources. Then we move over, so this is the awareness building part of it, the relate, reveal, you know, tell the whole right here. We get into this portion of the curriculum and it's taking action. This is primarily for students, but it gives ideas of what you can do to mitigate or adapt to climate change. And then a place to share your stories, okay? If you forget everything else I told you today, you can go to the website and right there where it says resources, click on that, it says guide to the GWAL model. You know, say everything that I said in a much more succinct paragraph, okay? So it's www.g-wow.org. There are a lot of other communication resources, many, many, many that are excellent, um, that you can look at and look at their strategies. Uh, we'll see your climate generation has been in uh, the northern uh, Wisconsin area and northern Michigan and, and Minnesota, uh, talking about how to get youth involved through active listening and then and telling climate stories. Skeptical Science is an excellent website for looking at how to communicate about science by presenting a fact, acknowledging a myth, such as climate, the myth is climate change is caused by sunspots. You, you tell the fact, you, you examine the myth, and then you give the rest of the story. And they, they set up strategies on how to communicate about climate change that way. All of these are great tools. And you can learn more. For example, this summer, I'm offering a Climate Strong, Climate Leadership Communication course program at Professional Development Institute for educators, whether they be teachers, informal community uh, leaders of youth, um, people such as yourself. And what we're doing is we're trying to increase climate literacy, communication skills, and leadership confidence to go back into communities, especially working with youth, and help them with their communities to develop climate resiliency. And I have a couple uh, handouts if anybody would like a flyer. This flyer, I have some right there for you to take. 
All right, so I'm going to leave you with this quote from Joe Rose, who is a tribal elder, Bad River tribal elder. Um, Joe has shared with us that the Ojibwe people believe that we must think seven generations ahead when making decisions today. All cultures share responsibility for protecting our home, the earth. We cannot eliminate all risks from climate change, but we can make a difference in slowing its impact. The culture and life ways of future generations will be affected by the choices that we make. So we invite you to use this GWO model, to use the interpretive framework for your science communication um, to help create action on climate change or whatever climate or science topic that you're speaking of. Our website, and please feel free to contact me if I can provide any help.